Welcome, folks, to another episode of That Anita Live. This week, my guest is talk show host, author, educator, business owner, mentor, and inspirational speaker, Tyra Garlington. Tyra has overcome many obstacles. She suffered abuse, loss, and even cancer. But today, she's here to share with us how she survived a suicide attempt. How did she turn her internal pains into talks that would help others who faced insurmountable goals. She is drawn to charitable and service organizations that tackle domestic violence, homelessness, and children who live in worlds they cannot control. Welcome Tyra to Teach and to Share. Thank you so much, Anita. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> I love your show. I listen to the episodes and I think for me what's special is you're authentic. You reach out and you care, and you listen intentionally, and you honor each one of your guests, regardless of their journey. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for agreeing to come and fitting me into your schedule. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yes. So jump right in. Tell me, paint the picture for me first, and tell me what you were working on and where you were in your life before this bottom out happened. I'd like to start with a couple of statements. I want your listeners, your viewers, to understand two things. Um, first of all, everyone, everyone has a story. And everyone is a story. And for us, life is a process. So we have steps within that process. We move forward, we move backward, we move up, we move down. And our stories take those same turns. And sometimes when the stories are down or backward, we have to be vulnerable enough to tell them and we have to be honest enough to tell them. And for me, that wasn't easy. I had to learn it. I was the type of person who said, Tyra, how you doing? I'd be going fine, dying inside, you hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I look like on the outside, I was real successful. And on the inside, I had not learned yet that I was worthy that I came here with everything that I need to be who God created me to be. And so therefore I struggled because I was emotionally dishonest. And I discovered as I went through my period, my sad season, that there were people who loved me and saw what was going on anyway. And so what I say right now to anyone is, you are a gift to this world. Unwrap yourself. Regardless of the journey, you're worthy and you have something to give. When I think about my season, um, I have to look back. And I tell this story, and even though I'm a survivor, there are times when I think about it and I hurt. So the story that I'm telling today is not really a head-to-head -head story. It's a heart-to-heart -heart and a spirit-to-spirit -spirit story. Okay. Um, on the outside. At that, in that season, I looked like I was doing really well. I was living large. I had a husband that I had been married to, and he was handsome, he was a dean, he wore glasses, and there was a lot I didn't know. So he was presenting just like I was presenting, trappings. At the same time, I had a great job with IBM. I was, um, I moved my way up to headquarters, mm -hmm. and for a woman, and for a woman of color, I was on a fast track, and it felt good. And I had two sons, and I was living large, beautiful home, 250 trees, water out back, island, the whole thing, traveling all over the world. And then, all of a sudden, I hit a four-way stop. All the air went out of my tires, and I just sat. And what I realized now, I did not know then, things that I had not dealt with in my past, mm -hmm. things, the PTSD that hadn't been washed away, worked away, because I had so many external pressures, I no longer could protect them, I couldn't hide them, my mask. Now when you say a four-way stop, what do you mean? I just sat, just like this. In your car? No, I, no, I mean literally my life came to a four-way mm -hmm. stop. I'm in my house, I don't go out of my house, I'm not talking to anybody, I'm not answering the phone, I'm just sitting. Stop going to work? Yeah, and I called IBM, they're great. Call their mental health line, I'm in trouble. 
set me up with a therapist three, three times a week, talk therapy and Prozac. Well, okay, it still didn't work. One day I'm in therapy and my husband busts in the doors and he says, what the hell is clinical depression? What's wrong with her? She's not fun, she doesn't go out, she, she just, she's not a wife to me. The kitchen was never her friend, but now she doesn't even eat. You fix her or I'm gone. Now here's the thing, he was gone anyway. He was gone with his mixed doubles partner, tennis partner at the club, and I didn't care. I just didn't care. So he leaves, we finish the session, and I'm in my car, and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, you know how overachievers think. Prozac isn't working, talk therapy isn't working, and my, my husband's saying, look, if you don't get fixed, I'm out of here. So I'm driving along a road, this is my favorite road, we're out in the country, and it's nothing but fields and occasional beautiful tree. And I say to myself, well, shoot, I can fix me. And all of a sudden, I notice my foot is getting heavy on the gas, and I'm just like, I can fix me. I can fix me. And I see one of my favorite trees. I say, I know I can fix me. And I go like this. And I head toward the tree, and it's way far away. But as I get close to the tree, I begin to discern some kind of movement. And I get closer, and so I'm like, God, what is that little girl doing there all by herself where her parents to protect her? Oh my God, oh my God. Foot off, foot on the brakes, turning the wheel, car spinning like this. I, Get out of the seat, going, oh my God, oh my God, where are you, where are you, little girl, where are you? I'm in all this dust and dirt, and a couple, you know, drives up, ma'am, are you okay? We saw you from the field. And I said, you've got to help me find the little girl. I think I heard it, we've got to find the little girl. She, nobody take care of her. And they said, ma'am, ain't nobody here but us. And when they closed the door to the locked suicide ward, uh, that was like somebody put a can on top of my heart. And I, um, I shut down. I stopped talking. You know in a locked suicide ward, you have to ask for a toothbrush. Mm. You have to ask for soap. You have to ask, and your door has to be open because every 15 minutes they come and see if, you, you're, doing, if you're doing all right. Now obviously you're not doing all right because you're in a locked suicide right. ward, right? <laughs> and what was, what I remember is people wandering around. There are a lot of different kinds of people that are in a locked suicide ward. They have different stories, different challenges. Some eat out of garbage cans, you know, some just hum, that kind of thing. It was not, it was not uh, a good season. And I uh, went to meet the psychiatrist, intake time, and he said, so Tyra, I understand that uh, you've stopped talking. I just looked at him, he said, well, I need to tell you this. Prozac has uh, side effects. They make people think of suicide. And of course, I'm an overachiever. I'm not gonna think about it, I'm gonna do it, right? He said, well, we're gonna have to keep you here because we have to detox you. And it's the type of detox where you have to be monitored. And once we do that, we're going to give you another medication, see how it works with your system. I didn't care. So he gives me a journal and he says, well, you don't want to talk? Right. And Anita, I did. I just wrote, I, it was, I didn't think about it. I was just writing, writing, free form, writing, writing. And when I read what I wrote, which is much of which is in my book, I think I began to open up. And I also discovered I wasn't alone. Um, I was so raw that when God reached out for me, he touched me and he talked to me and he says to me, look, I'm here. I never left you. I never left, left you when you were being raped. I never left you when the policeman beat you to a pulp because you were who you were in the South. I've been here all along. I'm here for you now, but I need you to fight. I need you to understand that you're worthy, that you're mine, that you have a purpose. And so I guess after a while, because I, it went on after the, after the release, mm -hmm. I, I heard him. 
So when you got released, where did you go? Home and so back into therapy. So to the home that you shared with your husband? Sharing of a type, yes. And he was still there? As much as he was before I took my dive, yes. So in addition to dealing with the infidelity in the marriage, was there anything else that yes. pushed you to? And this, this, is, this is hard. Uh, my husband was a functional alcoholic. And uh, I tried for so many years to hide what happened to me when he was in that condition. And after 18 years of marriage, I found myself putting on makeup and putting on a mask. When I walked out the front door, I said, showtime. When I came home, the mask fell off, and there it was. So um, that's part of it. But God changed my name from depressed to delivered and from, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a hard story to tell. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, usually I have cards. I have no cards because I know Ms. Garlington personally, and I knew that this episode I would not have to have talking points or questions. When we come back, we will get more into Tyra's story. What if I told you that you could stop the negative tape from playing inside your head? What if, with seven simple steps, you could leave the pain of the past behind and live every day as your true, authentic self? It is possible, and you can do it. The ebook, Seven Simple Steps to Beat Emotional Baggage How to Become Whole, Healed, Healthy, and Happy shares how to resolve emotional baggage and feel free to live true to your own personality, spirit, and character. Transform negative thinking into positive thinking and become equipped to boldly face your past and resolve emotional pain. Get your free copy at thatanitalive.com slash ebook. Welcome back. We're here today with Ms. Tyra Gollinson, and she is sharing with us her extraordinary story of overcoming tragedy after trauma after tragedy. Tyra has written a book called The Memory Box, and we're just going to highlight some of the most interesting aspects of the book. The first section, called The End is the Beginning. Yes. What does that mean? It means it was motivated by my surviving suicide. Very often when you see something as the end, if you move through it, on the other side of through, it's a new beginning. And that's what that chapter's about. Um, I had several new beginnings in my life, and that, that particular story was motivated by uh, being fired from a very high-powered job, having to leave Fairfax County, having to sell my condo, which I had just renovated, and uh, moving back to Florida because I couldn't afford to stay here. And that was retooling because I left Florida, I left my marriage and after 20 years, and I came here, and I was, thought I was, thought I was living large again, and uh, not. But the important thing to remember is process and steps. Mm -hmm. And so I am very loyal. And I guess God says, well, you know, I got to end things to make her go where I want her to go. So that's what happened there. And I spent time in Florida recalibrating and writing and praying. Then you have Daddy, my king of everything. Oh God, yes. I didn't meet my daddy until I was four years old. He was in the service and he was in the veterans hospital. And so mother talked, we talked to a picture every night. And then she would go see him and I would stay with grandmother. Uh, and But I didn't know him. So when I was four years old, one morning I got up out of my room going to see mommy and there was the guy in the picture. But but wait a minute, I wasn't ready for him. Where is he gonna sleep? Who is he? Who is he really? Is this daddy? He opened his mouth and whatever he said made me feel like I'd be safe and loved forever. But then he died really early. So there it was again, you know, yeah. For the, for the years that you did have your father, because there were some that would believe 
that if you have your mom and your dad in the same household, that, that creates a perfect household. No. Ergo, you have no problems. No. Never. No. I think when, I can just say my marriage, you get two people coming together. They're bringing in a community of experiences and people with them. And then there's a family of people that live inside of us. You know, I begin to think like there's somebody and my great grandmother's probably in there and my great grandfather's in there. And all of that makes me up, makes me, makes me who I am. So you put that in a house, it don't mean it's gonna be smooth. It just means you're all in there together. And of course, mom and dad had to adjust to being together after four years absence. And then there was me. And um, my father has a unique knack, had a unique knack. He could make two women who you would think would vie for his love feel like the sun rose and set in each one of us. He was, he was my king of everything. Yeah. Blessed to be the family. That's us coming together. And that speaks to our personalities and our isms. And I laugh sometimes because daddy was a, he was a counselor and then a, a principal. I came from four generations of educators and mother was a teacher for 30 years. Mother was, she talked, she talked, she talked. If she was unhappy, she talked. And daddy would make the point, make the, you know, this is da 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 da, -da and then we'd be quiet. Daddy, I can go out and come back in, and mother goes, and another thing, you know, from four, four hours ago, and she did, did talk and talk. So we were meshing as a family. We were good in that uh, we had a faith base. We shared a lot. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of things together. But Daddy brought back some brokenness with him. And remember, Mommy had me by herself raising me. For you. Yes, yes. And then there were the teenage years, and you know what happens to us. We get grown. Yes, and crazy. <laughs> we lose our minds for a good five to 10 years. So that's what that's about. A lot of that's funny though. A lot of that's very funny. Lessons not taught in school. Yes. And that's a chapter on uh, spending time with grandmother and Jim Crow and going from Ohio to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And as a three-year-old, you know how rambunctious we are and mo a grandmother teaching me what fountain where I could go, what I could say. And my grandmother was like royalty. We would sit on the swing in our house, on our porch and talk about things. But uh, that time, that time was a very painful time. We were separate this, separate that. Uh, the N word was a part of the conversation. And I remember. As it is becoming now. Yes. And I remember sitting with mommy when she'd come to get me. We were all sitting around and I'm having my coffee, which was really pet milk turned brown, having my coffee. And I remember saying to him, mommy, daddy, no, mommy, grandma, what's a N? And they look at me and they're thinking, okay, at three years old, we have to explain to her what this means. I ran into that again. I was coming home from graduate school, mother and I talking, we had taken daddy to the airport. We were speeding. The airport for Cincinnati is in Kentucky. We were pulled over. Long story short, I was extracted from my car, thrown into their car, uh, driven away, and mom, trying to get money because they wanted cash for the ticket, looking at me. Now, mom from the South knew what happened to women driven away, what the norm was, by police officers. They stopped one time and to teach me a lesson. Now, I haven't said a word because I am scared to death and in shock. They pulled me out and they said, look, your kind is getting too bold. They beat me, they kicked me, they did all, I mean, they hurt me. And they drove me to a local lockup, dragged me up the stairs. The only, the only name they knew, no paperwork, was in. Put me in a cell and left me there. And long story short again, I was blessed. Connections were made, my, parent, my, my mom and our surrogate father found me. And when I went home, I had PTSD really badly. Uh, the doctor came and they, you know, they said, we can fix her physically, but we can't get in there where she is because that's the only place I felt was safe, really in there. Deep down inside. And I was in graduate school and I was training to be a counseling psychologist for two years. And my faculty said, Welcome 
welcome to That Anita Live TV on YouTube. Here at That Anita Live, I share episodes about emotional healing to help you create a happier life. How do I do that? Through awareness, education, and most importantly, you, the community. By sharing tips and techniques from real people with real stories of overcoming trauma and abuse to live relentless lives. Hanging out with me, you'll laugh, you'll learn, but most importantly, you'll heal. Never miss a moment. Subscribe to That Anita Lives YouTube channel today. Subscribe via thatanitalive.com forward slash YouTube. You know, if you can get her here at some point, we've got all kinds of resources. We have the University of California. Uh, we can help her. And my parents are going, that's our baby. And where is she? You know, where is she? We can't get her back. So that's lessons not taught in school. First with grandmother at three. Don't know how much I learned, but certainly at 26, it was meaningful. Marks of audacity. That's me taking uh, risk doing things that are outside of my lane. And we can just go on to the next one. <laughs> Repositioning. <laughs> that, that was required <laughs> in every season of my life. <laughs> I just love how she just comes in and just takes over. No, no, that's not the order we're going to go on. We're going to do this this way. <laughs> this is how we're going to do it. Well, I found that when I was, particularly when I was having that experience with God, he was indeed repositioning me because he told me he had a job for me. He had something for me to do. And that was to take all the things that I had learned, combine them with the faith and the new strength I had, and to take that and push it out to others and to unite and connect with the brokenness in others and let them know it's okay. So many of the things in there, I had a friend say, Tara, you know, you're like the phoenix. You should have been dead. I mean, you got brain tumors, you got cancer, you got a car accident. They said you'd never walk again. You got divorce, you got unemployment, you got homelessness, and here you are. But I think those things for, were for me to learn compassion about the, having the ability to connect with people that may have had that without having to tell my story. It's something that he gave me that I don't know, I could be in a grocery line and say, how are you? And somebody will tell me. And I'm able to give them a moment of encouragement. Mm. And that's important to me. Everybody needs to understand they're not the only one. And so repositioning started there with that experience, changing my name from betrayed to beloved and saying, go. Deliverance. Yes, yes, absolutely. I am delivered, and so are you. And in that chapter, in that section. That is a recap. I need to tell you about the book. The tagline is a true story of the power and provision of God's grace. So at the end of each story, I tell you it's reflections through the lens of grace. So that when I tell you the story, I'm one place. But as I reflect on it, as I've grown, because you know I'm at the end of my toilet paper roll when you talk about seasons in life. And so, I can talk to multi-generations, you know? I, I can. Ooh, Lord. In fact, I find it fun. Mm -hmm. I, I actually mentor some uh, millennials. And, well, Miss Tyra, such and such and such and such. I said, yes, sweetie. And, well, why do you keep coming to our thing? Because I love you and I want to be with you. Well, Miss Tyra, can we do, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, that didn't answer your question, but. My soul at war. That was my test. How long do you stay in a marriage when you're losing yourself? Although it was sacred to me, did I have the strength to walk away and survive and be who I am today? And I walked away. And I want everyone to know again. What if I told you that you could stop the negative tape from playing inside your head? What if, with seven simple steps, you could leave the pain of the past behind and live every day as your true, authentic self? It is possible.
and you can do it. The ebook, Seven Simple Steps to Beat Emotional Baggage, How to Become Whole, Healed, Healthy, and Happy, shares how to resolve emotional baggage. And feel free to live true to your own personality, spirit, and character. Transform negative thinking into positive thinking and become equipped to boldly face your past and resolve emotional pain. Get your free copy at thatanitalive.com slash ebook. And how worthy they are, how worthy you are. Um, nothing that's happened to you, the good, the bad, or the scary will ever be wasted in your life. Do you still have uh, PTSD from any triggers that may happen? I do have some How triggers. Do you manage? I pray, I, act, I work out a lot, and uh, I talk. A good conversation mm -hmm. sometimes can minimize the trauma, yeah. So is there anyone in particular that you reach out for when you need to talk? Uh, I just lost my friend that I could count on. Mm -hmm. I have, as you might expect, uh, a small tribe. I think if you have maybe three or four really good friends. <laughs> That's a lot. Yes. Um, people that can see your soul. Yes. I do have a friend that and I... And accept you as you are. Yes. And want you to be that person. Mm -hmm. um, you got your haters, you know. But here's the thing that I've learned. I refuse to be refused. Yeah. I refuse to let my past get in the way of my destiny. And I refuse to let somebody say, oh man, I can't do that. I said, what do you want to do? You know? Yes, you, it's a decision. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude. It's a choice. And we just have to flip the script. And what I, what I want them to know is that I'm here. I hear you. And I'm here for you. Surviving tough times is a process. You can make it if you take it day by day. We all have a story. The question is whether or not we're ready to share that story. To seek help, you can contact your local crisis center, dial the National Crisis Hotline at 800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255. Because we know sometimes you don't want to be fixed Mm -hmm. You just want to be heard. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about Tyra, visit tyragarlington.com. Make the commitment to start your journey to emotional healing today. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check out thatanitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode.